A crisis is not a time to develop one's philosophy. A crisis is generally a time where people are not thinking very rationally. However, a crisis can also bring to the fore some very key ideas and an analysis of the reliability of one's previously developed philosophy. This, of course, is why it's imperative that we have clearly defined principles in advance of a crisis, because we will have developed them, one hopes, uh, reasonably and in a calm, reflective, and deep manner. And so we come to the present moment. The first thing I'd like to say to you as president of the Acton Institute is that we are concerned for all of our supporters and friends, wherever you may be, uh, I certainly have included you in my prayers and hope that you will include me and our staff here at the Acton Institute in your prayers. I just want to touch on a few things that this coronavirus crisis and all of the discussion and government edicts have brought to the fore to, in a way, remind us of some perennial uh, moral foundations for the good of society. I don't intend by this discussion to address myself to the nitty-gritty of particular policy proposals or debates, uh, much less predictions on the future of what's going to happen. But I do think this gives us an opportunity to reflect on some ideas that over 30 years now the Acton Institute has been putting forth and to see if we can uh, discern their applicability in this circumstance. One of the principles that we've spoken about many, many times uh, over the years is the principle of subsidiarity. Uh, this is the idea that central governments ought to act as a subsidium or as a help to lower levels of social organization. And boy, if there are any of the principles that we've talked about in the past that apply in this circumstance, I would think that it is the principle of subsidiarity. But this principle is often obscured, and I think in a very real way, uh, the present challenge gives us a, an opportunity to, to look at that a little more closely. The principle of subsidiarity, you'll remember, says that communities of a lower order should not be interfered with by communities of a higher order, except in grave need. And then those interventions that are justifiable in extreme circumstances should exist only as long as is necessary so as to permit the whole of society uh, to continue to function at all of its proper levels. It's obvious that uh, among the first things we have to look at is the reality of this crisis. And in this regard, uh, our belief in the compatibility of faith and reason also comes to the fore. So it does us no good to simply say we can pray away this virus. This necessitates the examination of this virus from a scientific point of view. On the other hand, uh, it is not just science, not just the data that speaks to us about our life as a community and how we can function and even prosper uh, in the face and in the aftermath of a crisis of this proportion. And so a view of human transcendence, of the dignity of the human person, uh, an anthropological uh, vision of human uh, destiny uh, all need to come into play if we're going to have hope in the circumstances that we face right now. One of the reasons a modest intervention on the part of the government uh, in the norms of life is so important is because most information that we can derive uh, within society is derived through that spontaneous connection that people have, whether it's in social relations or religious uh, communities or in market transactions that tell us 
what the desires, what the values, what the priorities are, what the resources are, and what the shortages are in a given society. However, when we are confronted with a thing like a, a contagion, uh, we do have to have some uh, interventions that are perfectly justifiable uh, by the principle of subsidiarity. In fact, the whole history of classical liberal thought uh, gives us uh, examples of this. If you look through Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, he speaks about necessary, though modest and temporary interventions that might exist. The challenge that this crisis presents to the free society is not that there might be temporary interventions that are called upon uh, for the common good and just basic common sense, but that these interventions could exist and perdure, that they can become permanent. In fact, uh, an author that I read many years ago, Robert Higgs, wrote an entire book on this called Crisis and Leviathan, in which he documents historical crises that have occurred and the way in which the government intervened and then ratcheted up and made more permanent its intervention so that we now have in society a whole plethora of government regulations and institutions that really cramp the productivity and the prosperity of society. What we need right now is uh, uh, cooperation uh, at every level of society to ensure not only that the contagion is constricted and that the priorities of health are accentuated, but also that remedies can emerge uh, for this virus, such as uh, vaccinations uh, and other um, medical interventions that are going to ensure the health and well-being of our communities into the future. All of this is to say that when the emergency uh, subsides, we have to be very clear that the intervention has to subside with it as well. It cannot become normative, and that has been the problem historically. So as we're in the midst of this circumstance, we need to think through uh, what the responses will be uh, as uh, society begins to function more normally again. Certainly free societies have an advantage over more constricted societies simply because the information flow is broader, more communicative in that sense, and also more innovative in terms of coming up with solutions to problems, and more prosperous, which means that we have uh, a lot of options on the table. So we have to look toward a free society in order to give us these advantages and advocate that for other societies as well. The efficiencies, for example, of the division of labor are what make possible the prosperity and the technological innovation and the scientific advancement uh, of societies. So those have to also be priorities both within the midst uh, of a crisis but going forth uh, in, as the crisis subsides. After all, emergency situations don't cancel out the um, communication of information that market prices uh, offer to society's advantage uh, in general. In summation, what I'm saying is that national security exceptions should not become the new status quo. And that's a great temptation, especially on the part of political leaders. Let me also for a moment reflect on the more lower levels of social organization and their importance in this circumstance. To the extent that informal communities or uh, mediating institutions like community centers and churches and family gatherings and other uh, organization of uh, fraternal support and charity, to the extent that these are vibrant and are allowed to function and prosper in society, this is a safeguard right now in the midst of a crisis because it is not bureaucracies that are going to look on, in on our neighbors in need, 
but people in families and in neighborhoods and in churches who are going to call people they know and say, how are you doing? My own parish right now is going through a whole process of this, whereby our parishioners are contacting other parishioners to see if there are any needs. And if somebody has, you'll pardon my reference, an abundance of toilet paper in the house, then they can call and uh, say to somebody who has a shortage, well, we have some for you. We realized that in the closing of our school, we had a whole bunch of toilet paper in storage that we're making available to uh, the people in our own community as an example of these kind of local communities being very efficient and uh, knowledgeable of what the needs are uh, on the local level. This points to the importance of religious communities and voluntary communities to be vibrant and a vital part, in fact, a normative part of the way in which society itself functions in general. Let me also indicate, uh, especially in the, the face of people calling for central health bureaucracies to manage the entirety of the problem, uh, especially on a, a world level, because this problem is affecting us on a world level, uh, let me indicate what a great danger is. Can you imagine, for example, had we already had a World Health Agency that was dictating the policy to all of the world, if that World Health Agency had its facts wrong, if one central bureaucracy developed an international policy for the whole world and that policy was mistaken in some vital way, even in some small way, what kind of disaster could occur. For example, let's say some World Health Agency dictated that the policy to be pursued was akin to the policy of Iran. This wouldn't then just be Iran's problem. It would become a world problem. This underscores the importance of competing knowledge bases, places where people are producing information that may not curtail with the central authority. And those can be to the great advantage of society in general. If, for instance, countries bordering Italy had to wait for the European Union to determine whether Italians could travel outside of their jurisdiction, what would have happened in terms of this contagion had one central authority made a decision of that import? There is, of course, a moral lesson in all of this for us. And uh, one of the important things, again, something that the Acton Institute has emphasized, that really the reason for our existence, is the lesson that liberty needs to be used responsibly. Our liberty, the use of our liberty in a responsible manner, means that we are the first to be accountable for how our actions affect the lives and the well-being of other people. If there is not a moral conscience that guides us, no amount of bureaucratic legislation is going to help remedy the situation ultimately. Therefore, we reiterate that liberty must go hand in hand with responsibility, with moral responsibility and moral accountability. This needs to be done with a deep concern for others, which of course is the basis uh, of our moral life. This also teaches us a lesson about the fact that we are not masters of the universe, that human society, indeed human life itself, is fragile, as is liberty, which Lord Acton reminds us of. So that having a transcendent vision, having an idea that there is something beyond this life, is what can help us to order our lives in a proper and moral way here and now. There is someone to whom each of us is accountable beyond government, beyond our own societies. Someone who knows us in the intimacies of our heart and our consciences. Someone who sees us when no one else sees us. And this God of whom I speak is not only our judge, but is our great consoler. So it's my prayer and my hope that you and your families, your communities, your society, 
will experience the comfort and sustenance of a benevolent God who sees our needs even better than we see them and who wills for us eternal relationship with him. Thank you, be safe, and may God bless you.